Hello and welcome to this edition of Vermont Standard Time, a public affairs and community news program here on Woodstock Community Television. Uh, collaboration between the Vermont Standard newspaper and WCTV. My name is Tom Ayers, senior staff writer with the Vermont Standard, and my guest for this program is the new Windsor County Sheriff, Ryan Palmer, who was elected last November and has been in office a little bit over three months now. We're going to talk about the role of the Sheriff's Department in Windsor County, some of the things that have been put into place since uh, Sheriff Palmer took over on February 1st, and a look at the future of law enforcement and the sheriff's role in our region. Welcome, Ryan. It's great Thanks, to have Tom. You here. I really appreciate you having me here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. So let's talk a little bit first, just very broadly, about the role of the sheriff's department uh, and how it fits into the law enforcement structure in the state of Vermont. Sure. So sheriffs are probably our oldest form of law enforcement in the state. Mm -hmm. it dates back to, you know, I think 1781 was when our first sheriff came into play. Um, what we do statutorily, so required by law, we provide a couple different services. One is the service of what we call civil process. So that's anything from a court subpoena, maybe uh, a debt collector's looking for somebody, you know, uh, divorce paperwork, those type of things. Mm -hmm. We serve that. I have two, two people basically dedicated full time to that. Uh, we're also tasked with transporting prisoners from people that are in custody from uh, jail to court. So I have two deputies that are actually paid by the state and they do that full time. Some other roles that we take on are contractual law enforcement. So a small town uh, in this area you have like Bridgewater, Pomfret, Barnard. Um, they're all probably too small to, to afford their own law enforcement and we contract with them. They pay us a fee per year and we provide law enforcement service for those small towns. Uh, we work with our other partners, whether they're municipal law enforcement, like the, the Village of Woodstock Police Department, or state police, or even some federal partners. We work hand in hand with them to provide law enforcement service across the county. Mm -hmm. We also work with uh, construction companies and maybe a school. You know, we've done basketball security at basketball games for Mid Vermont Christian Academy. We provide just today. I had uh, four deputies that uh, help transport what's called a wide load. Um, from the Massachusetts border. They're 112 foot steel beams mm -hmm. to a mm -hmm. uh, construction job in Berlin. So a lot of different moving parts and pieces. We also help out Department of Children and Families, Department of Mental Health, Department of Corrections. They're all under the Agency of Human Services. We provide different services for them, whether it's, uh, you know, just a couple weeks ago, I helped transport a young young man to, it was in DCF custody to uh, some secure housing that DCF provided, um, and we, we help facilitate those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the sheriff's role in Vermont has evolved a good deal over the course of the last generation, but it continues to evolve. Sure. And one of the things I know um, that, that has been of interest to you is really looking at that role and how how sheriffs can play a greater role in, in the law enforcement spe uh, spectrum. Can you talk a little bit about some of your vision and some of the things that, um, that perhaps in just the three months that you've been uh, in place uh, started to evolve the Windsor County Sheriff's Department? Sure, absolutely. And what we've seen in Vermont over the years that Vermont State Police played a very large role in what I call rural law enforcement. Right. right? Any of these towns that did not have their own police department, Vermont State Police kind of picked up the slack and were their local law enforcement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For a multitude of different reasons, they have shifted away from that. Uh, whether it's staffing issues, kind of cultural direction within the agency, what have you. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, for the last 40 years, contracted with towns to provide some level of service. Mostly what that looked like was strictly traffic enforcement mm -hmm. with the emphasis of on issuing traffic citations to pay to cover for the law enforcement service of issuing those traffic citations. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I label policing for profit. Right. 
what I wanted to get away from is strictly this idea that we're not going to answer calls for service. We're not going to go out of our way to be a good community partner. We're just simply going to write traffic citations. In some cases, it was 12 hours a day, seven days a week in a couple of towns. Um, and the very short version is that a portion of that fine went back to the town's general fund mm -hmm. and helped, you know, let's say they signed a contract for $100,000. Well, if they wrote $150,000 worth of tickets, it basically covered the contract and the town was in the black, uh, you know, fiscally for police service. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, my vision is, is being more of a holistic law enforcement agency, something that you would see maybe in California or Florida where the sheriff's departments are, play a much more prominent role in local law enforcement. Absolutely. And we've already started to do that. My directive is kind of, hey, uh, don't get me wrong, speed enforcement, especially in some of these, these major thoroughfares, is certainly important. But there's a lot of other parts and pieces to public safety. You know, so my directive was get out of the car, interact with people. We will take calls for service. In July, we're going to be taking calls for service in our contract towns, our nine contract towns, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 16 hours a day. And as we push forward over the next several years, I hope that's 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. But stopping into the local schools. I remember a story one of my, my uh, corporals told me the first couple of weeks on the job. He called me up on the phone. I could almost see his smile through the phone. But he said, hey, I stopped into the Barnard School and I met the principal and she loved us and gave us a tour and wants to give us keys so that so if there is an issue, we can respond. We know what the school looks like. You know, building those partnerships within the community is incredibly important to me, and that's really the, been this cultural shift within our agency. So how, how do you define, uh, it, it seems self-evident, um, the term calls for service. Sure. What, 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 it, what are the range of calls for services that you might uh, now be taking on you hidden, heretofore weren't? My neighbor's dog's barking, or my neighbor's committed a murder. I right. mean, it's everything in between, Absolutely, right? absolutely. Um, to where things that are maybe you might think are pretty minuscule. Um, oftentimes those things are very important to people though, the neighbor's dog barking or, or somebody left trash in my yard, to speeding complaints, to domestic uh, violence complaints. I mean, we're, we're making criminal cases now. DWE complaints, things yeah, like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly, and we've, you know, and we're now, just in, in recent memory, had two different occasions where my guys, and it was still light out, one was a, a, a alcohol DUI where uh, the guy almost struck our cruiser while we were on patrol. Another was uh, a DUI drug where the, the operator was, was uh, under the influence of marijuana, um, aggravated domestic assault. So all those things that before we really were just focused on speed enforcement and now we're reaching out to our communities and trying to be community problem solvers mm -hmm. and help you know, I always go, it sounds cheesy, but I always go back and when I'm, I'm telling my folks, our mission is to make the world a better place. So whatever we're doing, it should have the emphasis on, are we making the world a better place on how we're going about this? Yeah, yeah. There's a real shift. Um, I, I talked about the generational change in sheriff's departments. There's also been a generational change over the last generation or two in in policing, and I've actually written about this for the standard in the context of the recruitment for a new police chief to replace outgoing chief Robbie Blish. Sure. There's much more of an emphasis in policing these days on what the public has come, they, we hear this term community policing. Sure. It's much more of a proactive model than the old sort of crime fighting model of the of the past. Can you reflect on that a little bit and how that works into the context of what you're talking about? Yeah, and in community policing, that term community policing kind of developed in, in California and the LA area, yeah. I think back in the 80s, and it might yeah. have been even before that, but really there's a huge emphasis in the 80s, early 90s for community policing. I mean, there's even federal grants for it. Yeah. What I, for me, what community policing means is kind of that Andy Griffin scenario where you know your community. Right. Right? right, but there's also the element of proactive policing. You're out there solving the problems in your community, whether right. that's drug dealing, you know, uh, in your community, whether it's speeding, whether it's, you know, just mentoring some youth. But moving away from the us versus them mentality that that kind of sprung up after, I won't say after 9/11, but you, you really started to see this disconnect between 
law enforcement in the community. Mm -hmm. And so for me, we talk about police reform, all these other terms that are thrown out there. For me, it's the evolution of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. need to get back somewhat to our roots of being integral parts of our community, right. assimilating into that community and, and not being an occupying force. And that's kind of how I felt the Sheriff's Department was prior to taking office, that it was a bit of an occupying force mm -hmm. where we're just here, we're just here to make revenue, we're just here to stop people speeding, and we're not solving the community's issues. Right. We're saying that's state police's problem, or that's Rutland City, or Springfield, or whoever's problem, even though it was happening in our community, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. our county. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, as, as I put it simply in talking with our editor about this uh, last week in the context of the search for the police chief, it's about getting out of the car, getting out of the car and having face-to-face -face Absolutely. interpersonal relationships with people uh, in the community and, and, and they get to know you, you're not just a face behind a uniform. But, right, you know, and, yeah. and not even yeah. behind a uniform, but behind a car window. Right, exactly. And that's where there's a huge disconnect. We obviously feel very comfortable in our, in our police car. It's, it's something that I've made a career out of is stopping into the local businesses, stopping into the local restaurants, just saying hello, stopping mm -hmm. to the school. Hey, Tom, how's your day going? Mm -hmm. And you can get a lot by just, you know, initiating conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and make your community feel comfortable coming to you with problems. Because we all know if anyone's ever had to call up, you know, uh, 911 or your local law enforcement, whether it's, hey, there's a car swerving all over the road or a more serious complaint, it isn't the most comfortable feeling. Right. In fact, a lot of people probably dread it. Mm -hmm. And so breaking down those barriers in those walls to to allow your community to feel comfortable coming to you with their problems. That's that's high on my list of priorities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned Springfield. I've mentioned Woodstock. These are communities within the county that do have their own police departments. What is your interaction? Uh, what is the interaction between the sheriff's department and those communities that do have their own police departments? Yeah, you know, we work hand in hand together. Um, we have a fresh, overall, the executives, the law enforcement executives in this county are all relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, I think with the exception of, of Jeff Billings down Ludlow, who I work for, everyone else is within probably the last 10 years and mm -hmm. most of us are within the last couple years. Mm -hmm. um, and so a, a big focus of mine is make sure that we're relationship building with our partner, our law enforcement partners. Uh, so if they need help, you know, if we've, we've done lots of patrols in Springfield on, on some grant patrol to kind of help them out, give them some extra presence. Mm -hmm. I've worked with Windsor hand in hand because obviously that's where I live. Uh, Woodstock, we actually just, one of our new part-time folks has gone to to Woodstock full-time. It worked out, you know, great for them. So we're working hand-in-hand. Hand. Uh, I've got some things on my plate to kind of uh, set up, you know, uh, a meeting with all the, the local executives to, to really hone in, get on our same page. A lot of uh, coordination that we're working on in, in between us, but mm -hmm. the partnerships, I think, are the best that they've ever been with my agency uh, with our local partners. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know the role of the uh, of sheriff's departments around the state was on the legislative agenda in this past session. I, I've been remiss in following that legislation. I don't know where it stands, whether anything passed, but there was some talk about um, legislative reform in terms of the sheriff's role in Vermont. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, uh, sure. Uh, legislative change, I don't know that I would Go so reform. far as call as reform, yeah. um, and there was some changes uh, that have come through. The bills called S seventeen, mm -hmm. you know, sponsored in the GovOps Senate Committee. Um, some changes made to our compensation and other oh, okay. kind of higher level things that, yeah. Yeah. Um, some more policy type stuff that okay. that's gone on, but nothing. Yeah. Nothing that will directly impact the public at this point. Right. Okay. What um, what kind of certification process does a uh, an incoming a new deputy need to go through uh, as compared to um, 
what a, what a new police officer might to go through. Is we all go through the same training. You do. So everybody goes to the Vermont Police Academy, whether okay. you're a game warden, state trooper, municipal sheriff, everybody goes to the Vermont Police Academy for their training. Right. There's a couple different levels of certification in Vermont. Uh, basically, there's a level two and a level three. Level two was what we previously call the part-time certification, and level three is the full-time uh, certification where you go to 16 weeks at the Vermont Police Academy and mm -hmm. every full-time police officer goes through that. Um, five of my new deputies, six of my new deputies have gone through the level two certification mm -hmm. and that's two weeks at the police academy, um, a minimum of 60 hours on you know field training. We're, we're going to be at hundreds of hours mm -hmm. uh, in five or six other classes that mm -hmm. you have to take. Uh, and we're going to be well, well beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of in-house training here where we've used sea munitions to practice kind of car stops, force-on-force -force training, uh, hands-on use of force training. I have also have a uh, June 1st, we have some investigative training. I have five people there at a mental health training today. So uh, we're just pushing forward and, and trying to be the best trained and equipped department mm -hmm. that we can be. You raise an issue uh, just at the conclusion there um, that, that has been front and center in a lot of the discussions about policing in America, uh, mm -hmm. not just in, in Vermont, but and that is mental health intervention. Sure. Um, uh, where was that mental health training conducted? Is that part of the police academy? It's or? part of this particular batch is at the, the Vermont yeah. Police Academy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So um, a lot of misconceptions about law enforcement and their role in mental health crisis and how mm -hmm. we respond. At the state level, they've made certain changes to the use of force policy and how we respond to people in crisis. Um, but at the end of the day, regardless of, of you know, people's thoughts or feelings about the situation, 90% of the time it is going to be law enforcement that responds to somebody in active crisis, mm -hmm. right? And there's just Absolutely. no way getting away from that. Uh, yeah. We don't have the resources. Uh, oftentimes, these situations are not safe. So you can't just send in a social worker and go, hey, Godspeed, have fun with that. Yeah. So my goal is to make sure that we do go above and beyond uh, our training and our understanding of interacting with people with crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. been a cultural shift over the last several years uh, on how we interact and respond to folks. You know. The, the old way was kind of, I'm the police and I'm telling you to do this. But as we've become more educated on dealing with people in crisis, I went through the FBI Crisis Negotiator School, mm. uh, which was a week, week long school, but understanding that you can't have rational thought and elevate emotions at the same time, right? And then couple in any sort of mental illness with that, um, you have to take a much different approach mm -hmm. to where to, to dealing with these situations and sure. it can't be punitive it needs to be okay let's get this person help and figure out why this is the scenario I mean my folks dealt uh, we've had multiple situations since I've taken over where whether it was a school reaching out saying hey I have a kid that's that's having a hard time coming to school for a, a you know a litany of different issues um, I had two of my deputies spend three plus hours in one of those situations and have been following up. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, a person in one of our towns that was kind of dropped off by another agency that was dealing with some mental health issues, dealing with some uh, not having a home uh, and some other things and we spent you know two, three, four hours and got them services, got mm -hmm. them help mm -hmm. and that's the direction that I'm pushing this agency. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been three and a half months or so since you took yeah, over. Yeah, February 1st. Huh? Yeah. Um, uh, just, to, just to kind of s summarize here and, and, and wind things up, what's the first three and a half months been like? Um, uh, what are some of the um, uh, experiences you've had and, and um, any surprises? Well, two words, right? Phenomenal and busy. Mm -hmm. It's been a phenomenal experience. I have a fantastic team. The community support's been outstanding and we've made some significant strides, right? But it has been busy between yeah legislative changes, putting effort into there, between just the physical housekeeping of taking over an agency that, you know, the previous administration has been in this building for, I don't know, 40 20, years. well, 20 years here, in this and, you know, in this old, you know, and this is a, a prison here at the 
the studio is actually at the old Winstock Correctional Facility. <laughs> um, so just some physical housekeeping, mm -hmm. you know, some some small renovations in, where we're painting and making it a more welcoming place for the deputies to be. Mm -hmm. The policy and procedure changes, which have, have taken, you know, huge deals. And then our, what I would call infrastructure issues, where we're working on radio, you know, redoing our radio system. Uh, Senator Welch pushed forward a, a request from, from my office for $1.24 million for radios for correct, uh, congressionally directed spending. You know, we've had to order new cars, computers, all these things to be that modern professional law enforcement agency that the people of Windsor County expect and deserve. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of moving parts and pieces there. We've hired new people, we're training new people, um, we're training our old people, so it's, it's, it, but it's been phenomenal, the entire experience. Tommy right. Batista, who was here previously uh, as my Ministry of Lieutenant, making things you know function on the day to day, mm -hmm. and then all the other staff has just been top notch. Excellent, excellent. Well, Sheriff Palmer, it, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. I appreciate your taking the time out to join us here on Vermont Standard Time. Uh, wish you continued success in moving the department forward. Thank and, you, Tom. Uh, I want to I thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Take care.